For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Open your Bibles to Genesis 48. We're going to talk about mortal sickness. Try to take a look at this. It came about after these things. I'm in 48, 1 and 2. It came about after these things. At Joseph was told, Behold, your father is sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. When it was told to Jacob, Behold, your son Joseph has come to you. Israel collected his strength and sat up in the bed. He has become bedridden with his illness. Then Jacob said to Joseph, uh, then he goes into a whole discourse. I don't want to go through that discourse because we've studied it. But I do want to focus on the fact that his father is sick and he's become bedridden. And um, it gives me a chance to talk about mortal sickness. Okay. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our study. We give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt with the Holy Spirit to privilege to confess sin if necessary. Can't study the Bible as an unbeliever. You're not going to get anything from it. It's a historical book to you, but it's a spiritual book to us. You can't study it as a Christian in carnality because you can't learn it in the flesh. So confession of sin is important for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach you. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's a procedure for Bible study, not only in the learning, but in the living of the Word of God. Walking in the Spirit, studying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. You know, this is the dynamics of the church age. Father, we're so thankful today for these to come our way both by automobile and internet, and we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to those who take all of this serious in preparation. Uh, we've set aside this hour for our study. Without distractions, we're going to spend an hour with you in the Word of God on mortal sickness. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our souls because this is something everybody goes through, and we need to get a handle on it. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Jacob has become bedridden. He will not get out of bed. He will die in bed. When you read about his death, which is going to come in another chapter, we'll talk about it. We, Jacob, uh, Joseph has come to him. He's in bed. His sickness has caused him. He's bedridden, what we call bedridden. If you go to the 49th chapter and look at the last verse, it says, Jacob finished charging his sons, drew his feet into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. So this mortal sickness that he's engaged in has caused him to be bedridden, and he will die in this bed. Okay? He will die in bed. We're all going to die somewhere, but he's going to die in bed. Um, what you may not realize jumping into this passage that we've already know is that he's 130 years old. We know that from Genesis 47, 8, and 9 when he was in a conversation earlier. By that I mean a few, few years earlier uh, when he came and settled in Goshen in Egypt Pharaoh and he had a conversation and Jacob revealed that his age was 130 years old. That's the only indication we have of his age. In Genesis 48.10, in 48.10 we're told 
that his eyes were dimmed from age. Probably cataracts or something like that, I would imagine that day. 130, man. <laughs> All right. And his eyes are dimming a little bit. Holy catfish. Go Jacob. And you say, well, you know, they live different in that age, huh? He's in the post-Diluvian period. He lives in the same civilizational period as you and I do, as far as the Word of God. Uh, he lives in the post-Diluvian civilization. At time and age have caught up with jo Jacob. Time and age. It will with all of us. And it is time and age catching up with this is what we call mortal sickness, meaning that mortal means we're liable to death. We're liable to aging and we're liable to death. And um, so I've referred to this as mortal sickness. He's going to die, not necessarily from that. We die from something. But when it comes to time, we, we, we die when God has set our time to die. I'm not going to die one day early, one day early. There is an appointed time for everything. Now, we can all make appointed times. But who knows if we can get there, right? When God says there's an appointed time, it's going to roll over. It's going to come down the pipe just like he said. There's an appointed time. Only God can say that and fulfill that. No matter what our good intentions are, there's so many things that, so, I mean, we could get caught in a flood, a hurricane, a tornado, yada, yada, I mean, a thousand things. You know, we could get a toothache, a sinus headache. We, I mean, there's all kinds of things that could distract us from there, but not God. I mean, that's an amazing thing, and it's a principle of the sovereignty of God. So, he says there is an appointed time for everything. There is a time for every event under heaven. Now, when these events come to you, I mean, he just says every event. He don't tell you what the event is. <laughs> you write that in your journal. Right? But what he does tell us is that there is a time in the plan of God for every event in your life. That's pretty amazing. I mean, not only is there an appointed time for everything, but now it's reduced it right down into your life. There's an, there is a time for every event under heaven and then he starts his list. You know, he goes through this list now. He says there's a time for birth and there's a time to die. What we're going to learn about Joseph is it's his time to die. There's a time to die. There's a time to live and there's a time to die. And if you walk through the cemeteries, they will tell you that. They'll say here's the birth and date and here's the death date. And then they'll put a hyphen and that's your, your life. That's about what the rest of us think about it. Right? So, this is important. There's a time to be born. There's time to die. Jacob is in his time to die. And, and I'm going to do a study with you before I get out of this on the premonition. If you're a spiritual mature person, you will have a premonition. The Father will tell you when it's time. He, he does it throughout all the scriptures. And the thing is, you need to be prepared for that day when it comes that it's not a shocker that it's okay. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 4, when Paul is discussing a subject we just come off from out of 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection and how it affects us personally, how the resurrection affects you personally, he says, for indeed while we are in this tent, referring to our human body, because the detent in this passage, we groan, being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed to be clothed, talking about his resurrection body. So that what is mortal, that's where I got my idea, for from what is mortal, I put the Greek word there, what is mortal, meaning liable to death. 
what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. He's talking about death. Death, if you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, Death is life being swallowed up into life. I mean, how good is that? And therefore, believers that understand this, the only sadness they have at funerals is the fact that somebody they love has died and they're not going to see him again for a while. And they're, they're sad for that. And that sadness may last a pretty good while. I was thinking the other day I needed, there was something come up in my family background. I needed to talk to somebody. Everybody that would be able to give me an answer is dead. Then it dawns on you, whoa. I got nobody that really has got the inside scoop, you know, people who've got background and ancestry stuff. They're all dead. And when they were alive, I never thought of these things. Now they're dead. I got, you know, so apparently it's uh, not important or that time of an event would have been there, wouldn't it? Apparently it's not important as I thought it was. So that's where I got the idea of mortal sickness because it applies to Jacob for sure. I want to talk about four things about mortal sickness in the life of a believer such as Joseph uh, jo uh, Jacob, and it will be true, true for all of us. At the age of 130.1, at the age of 130, Jacob is experiencing mortal sickness as a bedridden believer. I'm going to tell you what I like about this guy, and I like it about everybody I read about in the Bible that are spiritually mature people. When death knocks on the door, they they say, "How do you, how do you come on in?" You know, this is a good thing for me. But one of the things I loved about Jacob in the story that we have in chapter 48 and 49, uh, as, and th this is the last of it, th this is the time of his dying. W one of the things I like is that his pulpit has become his bed, and he's having great ministry from it. I love that about him. I love that about him. You know, most people sit in the bed, eh, 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 I'm just laying here dying. Eh, eh, eh. Not him. Not him. And I love that about 130 years old, and he wasn't ready for no home. Don't be taking, I got business. I got things that got to be done. Yeah, but you're in a bed. I don't care. I can direct from the bed. And his office. <laughs> yeah. And I love that about him. And boy, did he really do a lot of great stuff from his bed. When you read chapter 48 and 49, what he did from his bed affected the history of Israel all the way to the second coming of Christ. He wasn't an old guy just rolled over and everybody telling him, well, you know, you're old and this and that. Yeah, so what? You know, old is just some age somebody gives you. Doesn't mean I'm old. So I love this about him. You read chapter 48 and chapter 49. He, he doesn't let his bed become his bed. It becomes his office, like Rick said. And that, that's a good point. Jacob is living in a normal event of life, and he knows this. This is not, this is not weird or unusual. He's living out a normal event of his life called the time to die. And f listen, for a, a, a spiritual mature believer, that is no different than it's a time to live. There's no different. There's a time to live for God. There's a time to die for God. Doesn't, it is no different. One's at the beginning of your life and the other's at the end of your life. Both of them are about life. I love that. And, of course, that's Ecclesiastes 3.2. People normally think about the time to die according to life expectancy. Life expectancy. That's how normal people think about it. Of course, we're not normal people, so we don't think about that way too much. But I looked up the stats. The recent stat says that the 
average man in the United States is going to live to 76. I've kicked that can down the pike. How about it, Johnny? Kick that can down the alley. But women, because I think they go to the doctors more often than we do, they live to 81. What? They're smarter too. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, they're smarter about some things, aren't they? Of course. <laughs> Wait. You talk about politicians. <laughs> we get we got politi we got politics going here. <clears throat> According listen, our life expectancy comes out of two things. Life expectancy, culture and the Bible. The culture says, the culture of America today says men live to 76. Listen, the only people that scare me that believe that are medical people. They scare me to death. How old are you? And they, that's like they walk out of the room and go to someplace else. You know what I'm saying? I, I, th those people drive me nuts because they believe in this, uh, this cultural life expectancy. But listen, for you, forget that foolishness. What you go by is biblical life expectancy. What you go by is what the Bible says. And let me tell you what the range in, in the Bible is. In Genesis 6, 3, it introduces to us 120 years. We're introduced to the concept of 120 years for life. In Psalms, the 90th chapter, verse 10, it introduced you that you, listen to me now, here's what people miss. 70 to 80 is when you've hit your prime. Now think about that. Think how the devil has lied to us. He tells you your prime is 60 to 70. And then the culture comes along and says, well, life expectancy is this. Well, listen, God says that's not, not. Listen, this guy lives in that biblical expectancy where you, listen, listen, by the time you hit 70, you just got enough sense to actually make choices. I mean, good ones. I mean, up to that time, I mean, you just, you don't know that, though, when you're living it. And isn't that a good thing? You thought you was the smartest thing that came along, and you were 16, and then 26, and then 46, and then, you know, 56, and now you're starting to get a little wise. Well, maybe I didn't have everything nailed down like I should have. But when you, 70 to 80 is right in the prime. You should, be have, you should have a good handle about what life is about, at least in your periphery. And that's when you've really hit your prime as far as being smart. You know, as a grandparent, I wish I'd have been as smart as I am when I was a parent. You know, my kids go like, well, well, they send me grandkids. You know, does your family send you kids? I mean, not to keep, to straighten them out. <laughs> they send me. And the grandkids now, on the way home, knowing that, they just stop off and go ahead and get it. Instead of going home saying, go back and see Grandpa, then the way home, they'll just stop by and say, I know that I'm going to be sent back, so I thought I'd catch you on the way home. It'd be okay. I went, well, yeah, come on in. Come on in. Let's talk. Uh, one of the kids called me one day and said, Grandpa? I said, yeah. Can I run away from home and come over there? <laughs> I said, Yes, if you'll go tell your parents you're running away from home and you're going to grandpa's, you, you tell them that. And if they say it's okay, you got it. You got the back bedroom. And sure enough, a knock on the door. They apparently had permission. I mean, who isn't glad to get rid of a kid that don't want to mind? So send them to me. So all we do is love on them, pet them, and give them everything they want, put them to bed. And, uh, and then the, the older children call and say, well, I, did you get them straightened out? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there. You won't have no more problem for a while with that kid for a while. Isn't that good? Of course, I couldn't have done that as a parent. Not, I'm not sure I should have. Should have. <laughs> but I can sure do it as a grandparent, and I sure do it. So post-Diluvian. So listen, it's okay to listen to a culture that says you're living to this age or that age. Uh, or listen to another culture that says if you eat beans three times a day, you will live to be 102 or something. You know, we, we get so goofy about this stuff. Listen to the Bible. 
when you hit 70, you should just hit your prime. Most people are, are quitting work and they ought to be now super, supervising. They ought to be in, in leadership capacity of that company at 70. I mean, you, you start stopping. Well, anyhow, I, I don't want to belay the whole thing, but the Bible gives you at 70, 80, you're hitting your prime. Uh, if you're going to retire because you're financially able, then find something to do with your life. Because you've hit your prime. Somebody needs what you've got. You've got a lot of smarts. So go find some place to, to do them. Uh, go volunteer at schools or, or colleges or something. Well, anyhow, that's my little soapbox for the day. So this is, this is Joseph. This is, jo this is uh, Jacob. Jacob is living in the post-Diluvian civilizational period. In other words, after Noah's flood. In Job, which lived in the same period of Abraham, we believe, in that period, it gives you an idea of how the believers thought. Job writes in 14.5, since his, and he's talking about our time on earth. It says, since his times are determined, since his days are determined, and the number of his months is with you, Lord, and his limits you have set so that he cannot pass. I mean, just think about that. I, I know we all count our days until we get to 16 or 21. And then we quit counting like we did. I just can't wait till I get to be whatever. Uh, the kid, I remember the girls, they thought when they got to be 13, they could start wearing makeup. We had that long conversation. That wasn't going to happen. And then I got into all natural beauty with him. Um, but, I, of course, I know when they went to school, they put it all on. And when they left school, they took it all off. You know, I understand how that game worked. Since his days are determined. See, this is part of that Ecclesiastes being lived out in your life. Since his days are determined, and the number of his months is with you, Lord, and his limits you have set so he cannot pass. This is brought out, the concept is brought out in Hebrews 9.27, uh, which is another good passage on that. The second thing is that the, that the thing that Jacob shows us is that there's a spiritual side to mortal sickness that is revealed to Jacob at the age of 130, Johnny. Whoa. Shirley just shook her head. <laughs> 130 with Johnny. <laughs> Holy catfish. Holy catfish. 62. No, it's a good thing you, you found a good woman. That would have been about four marriages for the average guy right there. <clears throat> well, anyhow. There's a spiritual side to more, and, and Jacob, for example, in, in chapter 48 and 49, you're going to see a guy whose eyes are dim, he's, he's feebly weak, I mean, he's in the time to dine, uh, he is 130 years old, he is, and listen, he's still running the farm, I mean, he's still operating, he's still patriarch, he's still patriarch, they still come to him. He's still patriarch. And listen, when you listen to J Jacob as he goes through all this, you're going to find a guy who is sharp in his mind, in his spirit, and in his soul. And let me tell you, you, you know what that is? That's that inner man that's been born again. That's that inner man that's been born again. Listen, the outside, it's going, it's going to get weather beaten. Life, it's just the way it is. We're, we're going to age. That's part of Adam's sin is the aging to the death. But listen, that inner man can be just as sharp, can be just, and, and, and he's a good example of it. He never will. Listen, he, he's got his hands to the plow, and he's plowing in the kingdom until he dies or the Lord comes. That's, that's, that's his attitude and should be ours. <laughs> Not only inside my church, but outside my church, you have no idea how many people tell me, ask me when I'm going to retire. People inside and outside.
when you attend my funeral. When you attend my funeral. Jacob is really sharp, and I love this. It gives me great encouragement as I move into my senior years. It gives me great encouragement. See this guy. He's sharp in the word. His prayer life is there. I mean, he's on, he's on it. He's on top of his game spiritually. He's 130 years old. I mean, he'd have been running the retirement home if he'd been there. He wouldn't have been a member, and he'd have been running it. I love that about him. And you can, you can see his alertness spiritually when you read chapters 48 and 49. Listen, that's true for all of us. If we'll just enter our spiritual journey with God and begin to walk with him daily, study him, pray with him, do the things that he, to build that inner person, that inner person. In 2 Corinthians, I want, to, I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians because I, I want you to put your eyes on this. I want you to put, even though I got it on your, in your, on your paper, I want you to put your eyes on this. In 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, for those of you who knew Sylvia Dennis, this was one of her all-time favorite passages. I don't know how many times her and I have sat and talked about this passage of Scripture. Um, in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, fourth chapter, verse 16, um, in the fourth chapter, I think I said the sixth chapter, didn't I? The fourth chapter, 16 uh, through 18. Uh, therefore, which means that I should, you should read everything <laughs> prior to that. So I'm jumping in here. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not become discouraged. We do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. I, d listen, you're missing one point in this. Day by day. See, it's a daily deal. It's a daily deal. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. It's a daily deal. And what it does, it builds the inner man to deal with whatever events comes your way. There's as many events coming to your life in death as there were in life. They're just different. They're not maybe less. In fact, they could be even more. And so in that passage, therefore we do not, he says we don't, and then he goes on, he says, for momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. That's what this, this is why you need to have the inner man renewed every day, day by day by day. For momentary light afflictions producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. In other words, nothing compared to on earth. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's exactly who Jacob is. But he couldn't see, he couldn't see the temporal because he didn't have eyesight anyhow. I mean, if he had them, he couldn't see them. But so we're talking about spiritual sight, spiritual eyes. This is a great passage of Scripture. And it's a passage, once you hit the 50 mark, you should pay a lot of attention to this passage of Scripture because it tells you that, it, listen, the secret is not how do I keep the outer from decaying, it's how do I keep the inner renewed day by day. And that's inhale, exhale of the Word of God. That's exercising the spiritual reason why you're still on earth. Just think about 130 years and he's still on earth and he's still doing what he was called to do. He's still a patriarch running the show. I love that. I love that. That He's not going to Chick-fil-A every day now, but he's still running the show. I love that. For example, Jacob, during this period of time, Jacob is sharp. He's still on top of ministering uh, responsibility as a patriarch of the Abrahamic covenant. He adopts Joseph's two sons, makes them heir into the tribal descents. That's going to be all the way to the end of time. You see, it is the word of God. I can't tell you how important this is. The word of God, as we know it, categorical Bible doctrine, studying the Bible 
categorically because that's the way we live it. You know, what's the Bible say about this? What's the Bible say about that? The word of God orients the spiritual mature believer to every event of life in the plan of God. That's why in the important, all these events are going to come your way. All these events are going to come your way. And uh, okay, all right, grab a chair. Are going to come your way and you're going to need the word of God for it. I mean, how do I deal with all the events that come my way? I mean, your life is going to be filled, according to Ecclesiastes, with events. So how do I deal with them? Uh, Proverbs 18, 14 says that the spirit of man can endure his sickness. But as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? Say, so that's inner man talk, isn't it? That's inner man talk. All right, here, here's the fourth thing. Now, this, in this one, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and we're going to look at verses 19 and 20, and I'm going to break it down so that we can see six principles. Six principles. Now, my point is this. One important doctrinal principle for the believer living in the church age with mortal sickness is that the church age believer body is the temple of God. I, I can't tell you how important it is for you to know that your body, which gets sick, is the temple of God. You understand that? It's the holies of holies. That is because you believe that Jesus came, died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. In the church age, the dispensation in which we live, when you believe that, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside your body and your body, in the eyes of God, becomes the temple of God, which in the Greek language is called naos, N-A-O-S, which means the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle where atonement was done once a year with the priest, the high priest. <clears throat> this is a really big deal <clears throat> because your body... I mean, I talk to the Lord every day about my body as the temple of God. It's my responsibility. It's the temple of God because of the Holy Spirit dwelling there. It's up to me to be sure that that temple is used a lot by the Holy Spirit. My job is to keep it clean so he can operate from it. And I talk to him every day about how important that is. How important it is for me to understand that. And we're talking about the physical body. We're talking about our physical body. It's the temple of God. <clears throat> so I, I, I personally think this is a big deal. So here are my six points. It comes out of 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> the sixth chapter, verse 19. He says, do you not know? And then he, he says, here are six things you should. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? That's the first thing. Do you not know? How is it that you don't know that? Well, because you don't, you don't pay any attention to the Word of God. Otherwise, you would know this. In a good teaching church, they're going to teach you that. Okay? <clears throat> You'll hear it a lot around here. Do you not know? One. That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, hold your place, but just drop over one book to the six, to Second Corinthians six, chapter verse sixteen, where he says this again. <clears throat> and this is a passage uh, of uh, of uh, don't be bound with unbelievers. You know what? And in this passage, in verse sixteen, he goes like. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, has fellowship with light and darkness? What harmony does uh, Christ have with Biel or, or the believer with the unbeliever? And then in verse 16 he says, and, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And then he gives us reference to Old Testament scripture. <clears throat> about, about why... How we, should, how we should treat our body as the temple of God 
and be aware of idolatrous practices with it. Isn't that interesting? And when he gets into this discussion, that's what his discussion is about. Why should you do it? Why should you keep, why should you honor your body in this way? It's because God wants to walk, walk among the people with you. See, like, like he says in verse 16. And therefore, uh, he goes into some discussion out of that, out of the Old Testament scriptures. The second thing in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the second thing that caught my attention is the fact that he says, the temple of God, of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, that means who dwells in you, who indwells you, the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the Godhead, Godhead dwells inside of every church age believer, whether he understands it or not. It's up, you know, he's there anyhow. It, it's, it's a given. In, in 1 Corinthians, in the third chapter, verse 16, he, he, he has already identified. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? And he's saying, why is it that you have, this hasn't clicked in your head? Because you've heard this a lot. I've taught this a lot. That's what he's meaning to this church. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God indwells you? That the Holy Spirit of God lives inside your body. Therefore, what you do with your body is important to God. And half, half of our sicknesses come from misuse of that concept. Then there's a third principle in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 20, oh, the 19, and that you are not your own, all right, and that you are not your own. Uh, I'm after, for you have been bought with, you are not your own. Uh, let's see, you are whom you have from God. Where'd that come from? 19, whom you have from God, right, who, listen, where did the Holy Spirit come where, when, did the, when did the Holy Spirit come? Point of salvation. How did he come? God sent him. He's a gift. Right? Galatians, and I put Galatians 3, 2 for you because that tells you that. Okay, we won't look it up. But it's, and then he says, and you are not your own. In, uh, I lost my place, in 6, 19. And you are not your own. Right? And you are not your own. You are not your own. You are not your own. Now you think you are. But you're not your own. You are not your own. Now he's going to tell you why you're not your own. Let me tell you why. He's going to tell you why you're not your own. You are not your own. And there's a great discussion that Paul gets into this thing. And he, he expands this idea in Ephesians 2, 18 through 22. He expands this idea of why you're not your own. Listen to me. First of all, you belong, you, belong to the, you belong to Christ, so you're not your own because you belong to Christ. The second thing is, is that you also belong to the church. Right? You are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ and into the body of Christ, the church. Therefore, you're not your own. You, first of all, you're, you, you belong to Christ. You also belong to the church. You are part of the body of Christ. You belong to Christ and you belong to the church of Christ. You belong to the body of Christ. And that's a big point. That I can't tell you how many times I use this with people who come in and they're, they're all upset about stuff they shouldn't be upset about because they think they're own. And I, I, I open this up and I read to them. I, re I read them this passage. I said, yeah, but you're not your own. Yeah, but you're not your own. You sound here. You came in here today and you sound like your person believes that you're your own. Well, I'm my own man. I'm my own boss. I'm all that. Well, let me tell you. Do you believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day to give you life everlasting? Yeah. Then you're not your own. <laughs> you're not your own. And uh, they'll go like, well, I never heard that before. And I said, well, you have now. 
And Paul goes into this discussion really well in Ephesians 2, 18 through 22, be well worth your time. And then, and then in verse 20, I'm in 620, he says, the reason you're not your own, you've been, the reason you're not your own, you have been bought with a price. You've been bought with a price. You've been bought with a price. What is that price? Christ died on the cross for our sins. That's the price. That's a price. And I love this in John 7, 37 through 39 when he says that when I leave and the Holy Spirit comes, he, when he goes inside you, your body will become an artesian well from which anybody you ever meet, any time ever in your life can drink from that water. Boy, that's, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's pretty good. And th then the sixth point that Paul makes, therefore, having known these five things, therefore glorify God in your body. Glorify God. I mean, who even thinks about doing it? They, listen, everybody, when they get body-oriented, thinks about glorifying themselves. The perfume, the, you know, you just name it all the way down. Same with the guys. They go to the gym, tell their nuts. It's, it's all about that. Now, I'm all about, I'm all about health. Don't misunderstand me. This is not what he says. He says, therefore, glorify God with your body. Glorify him with your body. Okay. Why? Because your body's the temple of God. He wants wherever your body's going, he, listen, God, the, these are the events that God has established, and he, you're going to need the ministry of the Holy Spirit to work your way through these events of your life every day. And they're great opportunities for ministry. It's kind of backed up today with people at the office. And I was running late. I knew I had to get home. I headed to the door with a tray full of stuff, you know, dump it. This young man says, I saw you back there talking with people with your Bible open. I went, well, here we go. I looked at my watch, and the father says, you look at the second time. And I said to him, well, I said, I did said inner dialogue. I said to him, I've been gone a pretty good while. I didn't realize the time it was. I need to get home to Jane. I said, I got Jane covered. Don't you worry about Jane. You worry about the young boy that just reached out and grabbed your arm and said, I saw you studying the Bible back there with people. Can we talk a moment? So I said to the Lord, you got, if you got that part covered at home, I got this one covered here. And he said, well, then get busy. If I had to listen to my inner dialogue to myself, I wouldn't have stopped. Because in my mind, in my heart, I need to get home. I hadn't, hadn't checked on Jane. I've been gone three hours. And I need to get back to make sure everything's going okay. So I just had that, you know, I had that moment with the Lord, and he just put peace in my heart about it. He said, look, deal with this. I got her. Deal with this. So I did. Okay? Listen, what am I t saying? This, you're, you're, your life is a mobile church. Your body is the temple of God. Glorify God with it. Glorify God with it. I mean, the Holy Spirit says, look, I got a guy who's been sitting there waiting. He's, I, got him all I got him primed up. He's been watching. I mean, I got him primed. Let's hit him. Let's get him. <coughs> My first idea was, no. No, I need to do that. And he went, Phew. you're talking to the wrong person. Come talk to me. I went, yeah, you're right. I know that inner dialogue gets me in trouble, so let me talk to you. Point number four. 
But let me tell you, if he'd put in my heart to go home, I'd have set up that appointment with that boy and said, listen, you want to talk to me, you got to talk to me tomorrow. i got to go home. Uh, God's, God, listen, it should be is, God, point four, God is greater than mortal sickness. You must always remember that. I don't care what you got. I don't care if you got toothache or cancer. I want you to remember this. God is greater than mortal sickness. He's God Almighty. Ain't nothing past your life that he hasn't signed off on. Nothing. And he's already signed off on death, so, right? We know that, just like he did birth. And I love this. This, this is one of these verses that I love. It's Psalms 41.3, and I wrote it down here for you. The Lord will sustain him upon his sickbed, and in his illness you restore him to health. I'm going to tell you how your prayer life should go for people who are sick. Pray for health. What they need is health. And the only person can give it. There's, a, there's not one doctor in the whole world worth his salt that won't tell you that he don't have the power to heal. Any doctor that tells you he has the power to heal you is a quack. I don't care how many degrees he's got. He don't have the power to heal you. And a good man knows that. A good doctor knows that. I can cut on you, but I can't heal you. I can take such and such out of you, but I can't heal you. What he says is the Lord will sustain him on his sickbed. Who is going to sustain you through your sickness? The Lord. And in his illness, you will restore him to health. And that's what you should pray for. Now, I don't know what that event is. I know the event that you're in, in is sickness. And I know the opposite of sickness is health. And he says, pray to the Lord of health. So I do. I do until it's done. One way or the other. Because that's what I think. The Lord means by this. Another great passage on this subject is Psalms 103, 1 through 5. And listen, there's two types of healings. You must be aware of these two types of healings. I don't know if I put this on your paper or not. Did I? Two types of healing. There's a physical and there's a spiritual. Now I want to show this to you. Look at 3 John 2. Go, go all the way back to your back of your book. Right, if you go on to Je if you go on to Revelation, back up, um, where this idea is brought out. Um, John writes to Gaius, "Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers." How about that? Just as your soul prospers. See, there's two areas of health. You could have great physical help and be in terrible shape spiritually. Or you could be really good shape spiritually and be in bad health. You understand? When you have both of them, do you realize how blessed you are when you have both of them? But if you had to have one or the other, you want spiritual help. Because that's that inner person. The outer person, sickness is a normal thing for them. Decaying, getting old, and getting sick. And then a time to die. That's normal. What's not normal is that inner person being on fire for God and alive. And powerful. Full of ministry. It's got nothing to do with the outer my body's still the temple of God, no matter what they're doing with it. They put chemo on me, they do this, they do that. That's got nothing to do. My body's still the temple of God. It don't belong to anybody but the Lord. Ain't nobody in the hospital. Nobody else has purchased that. How important is that for you to know that? And this is very important. Hezekiah is a great example in 2 Kings 20 
of this idea, the Lord will sustain him on his sickbed and, his, and in his illness restore him to health. Hezekiah was a, a, a wonderful king and a reformer. He was one of the great Jewish reformer kings. And he became mortally ill. Here's what people don't pay any attention to. Is what his age was. When he became mortally ill, he was 39 years of age. And Isaiah told him, go home and get your house in order. You're going to die. The Lord re reconfirm, reaffirmed that in his soul. And Hezekiah is famous for a prayer he prayed to the Lord. In Isaiah 38 and 2 Kings 20, he prayed this great prayer to the Lord. He was childless at the time. He was married, but childless. He started um, reigning when he was 25 or something like that. He's 39 years old because he died at 54. The Lord answered his prayer on his mortal sickness. The, the Lord answered his prayer and said, because of your prayer, because I'm going to give you 15 years. I'm going to extend your life 15 years. This is why maybe you shouldn't pray this prayer. <laughs> because that 15 years was miserable. He had a son. Two years, two years after he got well, he had a son. His son's name was Manasseh. Manasseh, I mean, it makes you want to spit. Manasseh. The Bible says that his son Manasseh is known as the one who did evil in the sight of the Lord. Manasseh. You know, you hear people say, be careful what you ask for. It is imperative for the believer experiencing mortal sickness to understand that God has a divine purpose with it. I laid four guys out for you to look at. I won't have time to go through all of it tonight with you. I picked a businessman, a community service person, a pastor teacher, and a world missionary that all went through Sickness. The famous businessman, of course, is Job. Job. And his whole suffering was over the angelic conflict. And one of the... James, the fifth chapter, verse 11, talks about Job. It says, considered, considered bless those who persevere under undeserved... Blessed are those who persevere under suffering and use Job as an example. Speaking to the church and he uses Job as an example to follow. Blessed is those who persevere, who understand that this suffering has a good ending with the Lord. In Job 42, 12, it says that the latter part of his life was greater than the first part of it. Most of us would have took the first part in a heartbeat. And you know what the book of Job was all about? That suffering, what that all was about in the life of Job was integrity towards God. Integrity. Spiritual integrity. And then we have Dorcas, also known as Tapitha. in Bradyville Lutheran Church in Michigan where some of my family attends and a lot of my friends I went to high school with attend that church. I was visiting one time going to the, went to service there when I'm in town. When I'm home, that's where I go. And they were talking, everybody there was a real buzz around the church and talking about their Dorcas class. And I went, like D-O-R-C-A-S? They said, yes. I said, well, what is that? And they, they have a, a ladies club. Dorcas was a wonderful community. Her life was devoted to widows 
and they made clothes and coverings and blankets and things like that for people in need. And listen, there are Dorcas clubs all over Christianity doing that very thing. This one in Bradyville Lutheran Church in Michigan, um, in the winter, uh, they gather clothes for the summer then thing. They gather clothes and they do quilting. And they do canning. And they, they have a mission. They give it out to people in need. And then what isn't given each year during the summer, that's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of resort around the lakes up there in this area. And uh, they sell them and, get, and support mission, missions with it. And they, they called it the Dorcas. And I thought, what a wonderful, and this is who Dorcas was. It, it's a wonderful story about her in Acts 9. It's a wonderful story about her. Uh, and when she died, you know, this is one where Peter went in and raised her from the dead. When she died, the, 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 the community, as well as the church, the, not only the church, but the community was just sad and mourned over because she was such a wonderful lady. All, always doing good and helping the poor was what she was known for. And then Epaphroditus, a famous pastor teacher. The, you know the wonderful thing about Epaphroditus that I love about him? He was a team player. If you study the life of Epaphroditus, and he's well worth studying, especially if you go into the ministry, most people, they like to study Timothy and, and Titus and guys like that. But this guy here, this guy's a real deal. You want to study somebody that, I mean, all of these guys were good. But this guy was unique. He, he was one of those team players. Paul refers to him as his brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, my fellow messenger of God, my fellow minister, my fellow warrior. Paul very seldom gives that many accolades to anybody. And this guy, if you know anything about his background, uh, he got sick and nearly died helping Paul. And uh, the church went into grief, I I even the thought of losing this man. And Paul, too. Paul said, this was just the worst experience of my life. And, um, but he is a, a wonderful guy. Um, and Paul, Paul can't say enough good things about him. And you can read about him in Philippians 2.25. And then, of course, Paul, that world missionary, who went through this wonderful experience in his life, you know, he, Paul went through uh, in 2 Corinthians 12 when he had the, got the thorn in the flesh. It's one of those things when we go through and we say, well, I'm, we say, I, I would never take anything for what I went through, but I wouldn't want to go through it again. That was Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 12. But what, but what Paul learned from that was just really phenomenal. And um, again, um, on the one hand, he got this, Paul says, I got this surpassing great revelation from God. And I got the thorn in the flesh because of it. <laughs> so, you know, it was one of those, I loved it, and now I got to carry this. And, um, and what did he learn? Oh, boy. What Paul learned through that whole thing, and he, he talks a lot about it, but what he learned is that weakness is a good thing. See, we, most of the time, we shine our strengths and hide our weaknesses. God made Paul flip it in his life. Paul was no different than the rest of us. We hide our weakness and shine our strengths. That's a kind of a human phenomenon. Paul, God taught Paul in this chapter, 2 Corinthians 12, to flip it. I want it changed in your life. I want you to shine your weaknesses and hide your strengths. Who does that? Paul. And Paul said, I'll tell you what I learned. I learned to, bo listen to what he says. I learned to boast in my weaknesses 
to boast in my insults, to boast in my hardships, to boast in my persecutions, to boast in my difficulties, and I'll tell you why. So that the power of Christ could rest upon me. He said I wouldn't change that part for anything. I mean, you got to become from a different de deck of cards, haven't you, to do that. I mean, if you did that at work, they'd fire you. You did that work in your marriage, they, it wouldn't try. I mean, but yet he flipped it on Paul. He flipped it on him. He said, I'm going to teach you something that's really important that you're missing. I put this thorn in your flesh so you can see that there's power in weakness, not in strength. When you're, when you're always thinking you're strong and you can handle the situation, you don't need God. But when you're weak and you can't do all that and you know you can't do it, that's when you need God. I want you to live that way every day of your life. Think about that. And he said, because you're not living that way, and that's the way I want you to live. And there's a great lesson for you and I about that. I don't know if any of us got the courage to do it, but maybe it would be good to do it volitionally rather than be forced into it. Right? Might, that might be a good idea. At least that's the way I think I will. Oh, I got it, Father. I got it. I got this. I, listen, I got this deal. Uh, I mean, I don't even like toothaches. Well, anyhow, that's that's about as far as I can get today, people. Uh, let's ha let's close this session with a, with a word of prayer, and then we'll have our normal prayer time as a family, church family. Let's pray. Our our Father, we're thankful today for a study on the mortal sickness. It, it's a, a there's a time to die, just like a time to live. There's a time to die. And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a normal thing. It's not an abnormal thing. But it's how we approach it is whether we can have the joy in the journey. And we've tried to look at it today to, to bring some spiritual understanding to it. I pray that would be true, Father, for those of us who have attended this study here traveling by automobile, as well as those who are traveling around the world with us by the Internet. I pray that the passages, that I pray they would get on the internet and pull down the study guide and look up these passages and study them and let the Holy Spirit teach them the truths that aren't found in them, just as we have today. It's just an introduction to the subject matter. The Holy Spirit will take, take everybody much further if they're willing to go on the subject matter introduced, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life.